All right. Uh, the world is a complicated place. Um, the, the naked human eye reveals many kinds of things, animate things like chairs and rocks and so on, and, and uh, uh, that, that is inanimate things, and animate things like birds and fish and people. Uh, natural science, and especially fundamental science, brings some unity to the blooming and buzzing confusion of ordinary observation. But it's, it still involves a lot of particular detail. The specific mass and charge of electrons, for example, and the number of them are the best current guess, I guess, that physicists have of the, the number of fundamental particles constituting our universe is 10 to the 80th power. That's a lot. Um, plus the size and structure of space-time and lots of other things. Whichever way you look at it, it doesn't seem to be necessary that things be the way that they are. Uh, I might have been a roofer, like my father, instead of a boring philosopher. And there might have been schmectrons rather than electrons as among the basic building blocks of physical reality, right? right? Some other kind of things that were disposed to, to interact in different ways than the particles that constitute our universe do, in fact, interact. Uh, there seem, in fact, to be no end to the way things might have been as opposed to the one complete way that things are, uh, where that includes both the past and the future. Philosophers express this by saying that most things about the world seem contingent, which just means that they might have been otherwise, uh, rather than necessary, such that things had to be that way, as perhaps with facts of pure mathematics and logic, which plausibly just have to be that way. It, it, it's not a contingent fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It had to be that way. But most of, we, most of the world around us doesn't seem to be like that. It doesn't seem to be absolutely necessary like facts of pure mathematics. Science is about the business of trying to explain how things actually are at a deep level and how they behave. That is, it proposes and ever refines accounts of the world's structure, what things are made of, and their dynamics how they interact and unfold over time. However, there can seem to be something necessarily left over, uh, something left unaccounted for, in principle, by our best scientific theories. The fact that things in general are as they are, for example, that there happens to be a world of the sort that we find and that science seeks to better understand. There undeniably is a powerful impetus in all of us to ask the question, while waving our hands all about, right, why is there this? Uh, why indeed is there anything at all? Yet a little reflection shows that a satisfactory answer to that question, right, the, the question that says after science is done, imagine a completed scientific explanation of all the basic structure and dynamics of reality, and you say, yeah, but why that, right? Uh, uh, when you think about what would it be to answer that, that kind of question, you realize pretty quickly that it would require an, an altogether different kind of explanation from the familiar sorts of explanations we, we give in science and even in everyday life. Would any sort manage to do? Could, could there even be an, a, 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 an answer to that question? If so, would more than one answer to that question be f at least formally satisfactory? Uh, these are uh, really big and long debated questions in philosophy. Uh, I, as Greg mentioned, I recently wrote a book addressing these uh, questions, a book called Theism and Ultimate Explanation, and one philosophical reviewer complained that it was much too short <laughs> for its topic. <laughs> so you'll be relieved to hear that uh, I am fully aware that my time this evening is short. All I, so all I aim to do tonight is to get us started thinking about the questions and to, and to address one central argument that many philosophers have given that, if successful, would bring the whole discussion of, of this question to a screeching halt. It is an argument to purpor that purports to show that it is impossible that these questions could have a constructive answer, or at least an answer uh, other than one that is too crazy to take seriously. 
I will try to show that the argument is mistaken and that we can learn something important about the nature of explanation, of specifically about causal explanation, by seeing that this, this argument is mistaken. But in a way, we will end up where we began. There is a question about existence that seems to cry out for an answer which science cannot provide. Um, but what else did you expect from a philosopher? Now, I'm also a Christian philosopher, so you'll have some idea of the kind of explanation that I'm attracted to. But I'm not going to, to argue that the best such explanation to the question would, on philosophical grounds, be a theistic explanation, although I do think that. Um, but that it would take, it would take more than one, one talk to, to really give a decent argument for that. Um, progress in philosophy comes slowly. I do hope that we'll come away with a better sense of the lay of the land. We'll see how to ask and how not to ask the central question concerning contingent existence. You might say, what do you mean you're going to tell us how to ask the question? Uh, progress in philosophy is often made by learning how to ask the right question. Framing the question the right way um, is, is often an important step to making progress. Um, and so I'm going to be fussing about different ways people have ex uh, framed this kind of question and try to persuade you that they frame the question the wrong way. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll begin to see what sort of po answers are possible to the question. Uh, thinking how to assess the relative ma uh, merits of these competing answers is going to be your homework exercise. I'll leave you to try to do that. Or maybe one of your philosophy instructors can pick up where I leave off. All right. So I'm going to start off by arguing that ultimate explanation, what I mean by explanation, you know, why is there anything at all? So the, the, a maximally comprehensive explanation is not to be found in empirical science. And it's not just because empirical science is incomplete. In principle, you couldn't have that kind of explanation in science. Um, some scientists uh, seem to think that in, you could have such an explanation. I could point you to a handful of books, popular sort of books, by very eminent physicists who think that, no, a theory of everything is right around the corner. And I think it, they're engaging in a bit of, at best, false advertising. Um, and uh, while, what, while, while the projects they're engaged in are, are perfectly respectable projects and really interesting, it would be exciting if they could achieve what, um, what they're hoping to achieve, it's n it would not be to answer our question. Okay? That's what I'm going to try to start off to persuade you. The ultimate explanation of contingent reality, the sum total of all the existing objects and their histories um, that might not have been, right? all the stuff like you and I and chairs and rooms and stars and, and, uh, and electrons and all that stuff that it seems like there might not have been any of that stuff, um, the explanation of the fact that there is all that stuff would be explanation that involves no, what I'll call, brute givens. It would leave no explanatory loose ends whatsoever. So it wouldn't be good enough that you say, well, I can explain all this in terms of some other fact, factor x, magical factor x. And then you say, why factor x? And the answer is no explanation. Right? That, would, that would not really be ultimate explanation. Right? It, would be, it would be conditional on something that, that's seems to cry out for further explanation. So that's not going to be good enough, right? It would have to be somehow a, a complete explanation such that you could not intelligibly ask for anything more. It's very high, very high standards uh, uh, to, to have that kind of explanation. All true, more limited explanations that we do have in science and in everyday life, uh, like when you explain things in terms of someone's beliefs and purposes and so forth, uh, all true uh, limited explanations would rest on something that not only has, has no further explanation, but can have no further, action, further explanation. All right, so no foundational physical theory, I claim, could aspire to explanation of that sort. Let's think about it. The best case scenario for such a physical, comprehensive physical theory, or why am I saying physical theory as opposed to biological? Well, because physics is our most general science. Right? It's supposed to, everything's composed of the stuff physics talks about, right? whereas not everything is biological, not everything is even chemical, um, and so on, or psychological. So you know, if, you're, if you're looking for a really general you know, explanation, you go down to the, to, to, the, to the engine room of science, and that's fundamental physics. Particle physics are science of the small, and quanti uh, uh, 
cosmology, you know, the large scale structure, and kind of bringing these two together, that's, that would be the best hope. That, that's where you would look in science for the biggest, most complete explanation you could have. Um, the best case scenario for such a theory would take on one of two forms. One would be a well-confirmed theory on which physical reality is eternal, lacking a beginning, lacking an ending, and is maximally simple at the fundamental level in terms of its ontology, what philosophers call it, that is what kinds of basic stuff it posits, like particles or fields, uh, its dynamics, the principles for how things unfold, how they interact, like force, uh, force principles and things, and its topological structure, what the, the properties that are assigned to the space in which things reside. Uh, so call this the way of eternity and unification, right? We, we on the one hand, we're, we're, the aim is to unify things, boil it down to the smallest number of possible basic posits, and, and to, to assume at least it's never had a beginning. Why? Because if it had a beginning, then we'd say, all right, well, what, what, how do we explain that initial state, right? And, and we'd be stuck. Right? So, so we, we, we definitely want to have no beginning if we're going to have a comprehensive physical theory uh, that, that, that could be complete. Uh, this way, this way of eternity plus unification, uh, the theoretical limit for it is a single simple equation. You know, just one dynamical equation that governs the distribution of a single fundamental particle. So instead of protons, electrons, you know, and, and so on. You just have one kind of entity, one dynamical principle that governs its kind all, and all the, the instances of it as they interact. And, and you would thereby realize what physicist uh, Steven Weinberg, a Nobel Prize winning physicist at the University of Texas, his dream, right, he says the dream of physics is to have an equation that our descendants might display on their t-shirts. Right? Even stupid teenagers could know the theory of everything. It's just this simple little equation governing this one little, you know, alpha particle. You know, maybe that would truly be, you know, the God particle. You know, if there was this one particle, that, that, that would... Um. However, even if it turns out that our world cooperates, there's no guarantee our world is like that, right? That there's just one fundamental kind of thing and one dynamical principle. So it's just a hope, right, that our world could turn out to be that way, but there's no guarantee. You know, physics just goes about its task and continually tries to simplify, simplify as it goes deeper and deeper. Uh, but suppose it does turn out that our world cooperates with this ambition. Um, and it can only reduce the number of contingent facts needing independent explanation. In the end, so even if it were so, the most fundamental fact of existence itself, the fact that there is anything answering to the simple equation, will necessarily be left unexplained. Hewing only to such a theory, ultimate explanation would elude our grasp, even if we'd have this beautiful, elegant, unified theory for how things uh, are and how they, how, they, how, they, how they unfold over time. Why there's anything like that would be left out of such an explanation. A second best case scenario uh, that some recent thinkers have entertained runs in rather the opposite direction. It seeks to explain, not by burrowing down to simple, ever more simple foundations, but by spreading out, right? We can imagine there being an elegant and empirically adequate theory that locates our entire universe within a vast structure of totalities, uh, other universes, that, uh, that together, as a, as a set of universes, to, uh, exhibit completely non-arbitrary properties, right? Every possibility gets realized in some universe or other. There might be a plenum then of disjoint island universes, uh, or, of, uh, or, or you might think of them as being causally non-interacting n-dimensional space times embedded within a single hyperspace of n plus one dimensions, right? You know, so we're used to thinking of three spatial dimensions, you know, up, down, 
you know, and then time uh, as, as the so-called fourth dimension. But imagine, it, well, you can't picture it, right? But, but um, you know, imagine that our three, dimen three dimensions of space are actually embedded within a, a fourth spatial dimension. Um, and, uh, and so you could have an unlimited number of three-dimensional spatial universes that are sort of closed within them, but they're all embedded within this larger um, four, four, four spatial plus one temporal dimension thing, right? Uh, either way you go, right, the idea would be reality would constitute this satisfying plenum uh, of uh, all mathematically consistent totalities, all possible universes, including every hyperspace configuration. As uh, the uh, eminent MIT physicist and closet metaphysician Max Tegmark proposes, uh, he, he's got a you want to, you could go online to Max Tegmark's website and he links to various, like he's got a Scientific American um, article, 2008 I think, uh, beautiful color pictures, you know, different uh, um, um, artistic ways of representing what the multiverse would be like, you know, all these bubbles, you know, but an infinite vast plenum. Um, and uh, he, he says he really believes that this is true. Um, uh, that is, he, th he thinks there's good reason to think it's true. Um, not a, it's a minority opinion. But, but call this the way of plenitude. All right, again, I want to grant, suppose, suppose that's right, right? Um, they're if that's right, there undeniably would be an elegance, a lack of arbitrariness um, in the hypothesis that every consistent universe exists, right? Rather than just saying, why do we just have this universe? It's got electrons. Right, again, and other kinds of fundamental particles, you know, maybe comprised of more basic things like quarks and so on. Um, but that's just one way things could be, and it just, you know, and it just happens to have a certain number of such particles, and, and there are certain, certain kinds of features of our universe. But the idea that all the possibilities get, you know, to, to, it appeals naturally to the mathematician and the philosopher's sensibility to just imagine all the, the beautiful, all the possibilities are all just kind of laid out there. There's something elegant and non-arbitrary about realities being that way. It, it, so it's a beautiful idea that, that, that just naturally appeals to the foundational theorist. But if it is a fact, and our reasons for embracing this picture of the world are wholly empirical, then we must suppose that that remarkable fact to be contingent. It's just the way things happen to be among the ever so many less elegant alternatives. So there might have been no multiverse, if, you know, even if there is a multiverse, that is multiple universes, the physicists use the term multiverse, um, th there might have been no multiverse, or there might have been a less complete multiverse. Or, you know, maybe, and so instead of infinitely many, maybe non-denumerably infinitely many uh, universes, let's say there might have been just 17 universes. And that's just, that's just the way it is, right? Or, uh, you know, it might be a single universe, as we usually suppose, of a single arbitrary type. So that the plenitudinous multiverse exists at all, if it's true, will not then have an ultimate explanation. We could still say, you know, waving our, our arms now much wider. <laughs> why that? You know, you know, this plus this plus this. Why, why all that? Uh, and, and from an empirical point of view, you just have to say, well, that's just the ultimate. That's where science leaves off, if it gave us reason to think that were so. OK. Um, if we seek an ultimate explanation of existence, we have to pass from physics to metaphysics. Right? Physicists, you know, they, 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 they tell us all kinds of fun things about, about the way the world actually is, you know, but if you want an answer to why is the world, why is there anything of this sort at all, we've got to get metaphysical um, uh, and uh, think about it in philosophical terms. How should one proceed in constructing and evaluating possible metaphysical answers to our existence question? Why this, regardless of what this turns out to be? A good place to, to start is to distinguish between explanations, what you might call real, full explanation, that's explanations properly speaking, and explanation schemas or outlines uh, that uh, specify a, more, a mere broad outline of the causally relevant features of uh, a putative cause and its manner of operation. It kind of, it's just kind of a sketch for how to think about it. It leaves out a lot of the details. But we should recognize at the same time that we could have reason to endorse a general explanation schema. There could be good reasons to say, say that there is an explanation of a broad sort to be, 
uh, there's reason to think there is an explanation of a broad sort, even if we're not capable of filling in the details. Um, that the, uh, uh, it, and the, the reason would be if the schema seems to provide the only or the best form of answer uh, as measured by standard um, uh, uh, criteria for goodness of theories, right? You can have reason for thinking the only possible answer would have to be of, of this kind of sort, right? And so that would be a kind of a schema, even if you can't flesh out all the details, you, maybe because the, the details are empirically inaccessible to you. You could still have really good reason for thinking it has to be that the explanation that we want, while we can't have it in principle in detail, we know it has to be of this general sort. Um, uh, note that, for example, uh, evolutionary theory, for those who embrace evolutionary theory, um, offers for many historical events an explanatory schema, uh, though a quite rich one, to be sure. Uh, it, right, if uh, uh, evolutionary the, the, uh, theory as a complete comprehensive theory of the, the development, the emergence and development of biological life, uh, is correct, it entails that there are true detailed explanations of a certain type for ever so many specific facts about biological history, but most of these, the actual explanations are unavailable to us, right? Because we don't have all the details. So, right, if you believe in the principle of natural selection over uh, random mutations, um, people often misunderstand that term random there, but nevertheless, if you, if you, if you accept that there is this, this, uh, this process of gradual accretions of changes uh, by, that come about in a certain manner, um, then, you know, of course, there are facts about living organisms millions of years ago, right? But we don't know. They're, they're, it's all lost to us, right? We might have a few bones or something. You know, we just got, we, we, we can't go back to the past and see the detailed explanation of how there came to be, you know, this sort of living system. But still, if, if evolutionary theory is true, it entails that there's a certain form of explanation. Whatever the details are, it came about via a process of natural selection over, over uh, modification, right? So, see, it, provide, so it, it indicates it, it's really a schema, right? Which we can fill in in some cases, perhaps, right? With more detail, uh, more or less detail. So, so, so there's nothing wrong with schemas of explanation, right? So we've got a, a science, historical science, uh, that is a historically oriented science, right? Which is in effect a very schematic explanation, as opposed to say a um, an explanation of the the uh, behavior of of gas molecules going on right now in a volume of gas. We could give a detailed explanation of that because we got perhaps all the relevant causal factors, and we could we could tell in detail what's going on there, right? Um, I, I, I've been fussing about schema versus full explanation because it's very important because sometimes the kind of explanation that I think we're going to need to, to provide ultimate explanation, uh, there's, uh, it, we're only going to be able to give a schematic explanation. And sometimes philosophers complain. They say, well, that's an empty explanation, right? It's you just say, well, you specify some hazy kind of features. And why, why think that? Well, sometimes there's good reason to think. Um, that a schematic form of explanation is true, even if we're not in a position to fill in the details. Um, so philosophers have pretty widely agreed that if there is to be ultimate explanation at all, we must suppose that there can be a kind of necessary existence. Existence, that is, the existence of something that has the same kind of necessity as the truths of pure mathematics. Right? So if there was a, a, a necessarily existing thing, right, it would exist in every possible reality. It would exist in worlds co uh, constituted at bottom by electrons and quarks and so on. It would e exist in a world where there are schmelectrons. It would exist in a world where there are only disembodied minds. It would exist in a world where there's just empty space but nothing uh, populating the space. It would exist, period. Right? Um, so philosophers, many philosophers doubt that there is any ultimate explanation um, to be had in principle, but most philosophers agree that if there is to be a good explanation, you're going to have to suppose that there is such a thing as necessary existence, non-contingent existence. Uh, and this would have to be had by the physical reality itself, as Spinoza famously thought, a uh, philosopher of the 17th century, or by some kind of maximally unified transcendent cause of physical reality. 
Necessary existence can have no direct role within empirical theory, though it is open to a scientist of a philosophical bent to suppose that it has application to physical reality, as Einstein, following Spinoza, seems to have done. Right? Uh, you know, Einstein. There are various Einstein liked to use various uh, slogans and mottos that people, you know, hear about and read on the internet out of context. And you know, so Einstein said things like, "God doesn't play dice." He didn't like statistical um, um, explanations in fundamental physics. He he wanted determinism to be true. Why? Well, he he tells us in his writings. This is not part of his scientific theory. It's his, it's the kind of philosophical side of Einstein. Uh, He's inspired by Spinoza, this picture of reality as just necessarily being the way it is, an unfolding of iron necessity. To Einstein, that's just the most beautiful, you know, for most people that's a frightening, terrifying thought. To contemplate, Einstein, this is just beautiful, right, this theory, because then it, everything has this kind of rich, full, complete explanation. Okay? Uh, but that's not part of the scientific theory. The scientific theory is just, here's the stuff there is, here are the dynamical principles, here's the, the space within which such stuff resides. That's the science. And then when you start saying, and it exists of necessity, um, th then you're doing philosophy, right? You know, that's not, it's not, the, the property of necessary existence doesn't play any explanatory role. Negative charge, that does explanatory work in, in science. Saying that that particle exists of necessity doesn't do any explanatory work, okay? It's a metaphysical claim about the empirical reality. Uh, none the worse for that. I'm, I'm a philosopher. I'm a metaphysician. I don't fault it on those grounds. I'm just saying it's not, that's not part of empirical theory. You, you've moved from science to, from, from physics to metaphysics if you make that kind of supposition. Uh, now, on a view that accepts the legitimacy of appealing to this feature, some philosophers famously don't are very suspicious of this idea of necessary existence, but it, it's claimed to be a substantial distinctive kind of property involving a superior mode of existing. Okay, now I'm kind of the, some of this language, your eyes are going to start glazing. But what I mean by that is just this, right? I'm a contingent being. Ever so many ways it, I could have failed to exist, right? My parents could have, could have fa failed to meet or my maternal or paternal grandparents could have failed to meet, meet or on and on and on. You know, you can get, you can get really scared if you start to, start to think about all the contingent events that had to have been the case for you, you know, to have come about. You know, that of all those millions of sperm cells that, you know, met with that uh, egg cell that, you know, it had it not been that one, it would, it would have been someone like me perhaps, but it wouldn't have been me. <gasps> I came so close to, to, to non-being, you know, never having been at all, right? My, my father uh, was a roofer uh, one time in Chicago, and uh, one time he was roofing in a building that was 20-some stories up, and he was walking along the edge of the building, and a sudden gust of wind uh, literally pushed him over the edge of the building. Um, and as he was falling uh, perhaps to his death, death, he just wild, and this was before I was born, he was 20 years old, before he was married, you know, he just kind of wildly flailed his arm to try to grab onto something, and there was a chain that was holding down this, you know, big tar pit, you know, to keep it from getting blown off the, uh, they didn't chain down the workers, but they chained down the equipment that was more valuable to the owners, perhaps. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just kind of a straight, you know, and, he, and it wrapped around his hand very quickly, and it saved his life, you know. But it, he, and he just blindly went this way, right? If he had gone this way, uh, no me, you know. And, 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 he, and he was, you know, he's a roofer back in the days before you have, um, uh, uh, now you have, uh, you know, nail guns, right? But that, back in his day, it was all boom, 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 boom. You know, so you had these big, meaty forearms, right? Because I calculate, one time I did a back of the envelope calculation for how, how long he worked, how many days of work he did. You know, I asked him questions, tried to figure out roughly how many times. You know, well over a million times with his left hand, <laughs> bam, bam, you know? And he could, he, could, he could hit a nail. You know, if I do it, it's like, kind of like tap, 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 get in. He's just like one little tiny tap just to set it, right? Little tap, boom. That boom, that you know, just very powerful arm, right? But he'd like to make a fist, and where one of his big knuckles should have been, it was just, it got crushed when, when, when he grabbed at that chain, and the whole bone just got just obliterated, right? But, oh, thank goodness, thank goodness, he grabbed that chain, right? Otherwise, so I'm a contingent being, right? That is, I ascent, what, what that means is I essentially depend on other things for my reality, both for my origin and for my continuing to exist. I need oxygen, right? If there's, and I need the non-presence of uh, 
meteorites crashing into my immediate environment. And all kinds of things have to be true for me to continue to exist. So I'm contingent, right? A necessary being, just think about it, would be the kind of thing that just exists by dint of its own nature, totally independent of any other reality. It relies on nothing for its existence, right? Remarkable sort of thing, um, if there is such a, a, a thing. Uh, and, the, and it seems like the difference between these two classes of things, the contingent things and the necessary things, is an intrinsic difference, and it's absolutely fundamental. Okay? The one class will include natures, or maybe just one nature, as I tend to think, that are self-existing, whereas the, those in the other class are ontologically, you know, that, that is, they're in, their, in their nature, and explanatorily incomplete in themselves. Existing, if at all, in dependency on other things and ultimately on a necessary being. All right, now consider the hypothesis that the totality of the physical universe is a metaphysically contingent being, it didn't have to exist, while being a timeless causal product of a being that exists of absolute necessity. Okay, we're, we're trying to think what form of explanations could there be to answer our question, why this? Well, here's a, here's a form of explanation. The totality of contingent reality is a timeless causal product of a, of an ap, a being that exists of absolute necessity. This is not much of a possible explanation of the universe. Most theoretical physicists wouldn't be terribly impressed by that. Like, That's your theory, right? You know, you know, okay, um, it, you know, since it tells us why, why would they be so, sort of disappointed maybe in it? Uh, well, it tells us nothing about the manner by which and the circumstances in which the necessary being gave rise to it. It just says there's a, a thing. It's a necessarily existing thing and it caused all of everything else. Uh, we might give the claim, so we could try to make it though a little more specific then. We could say the necessary being blindly and inevitably emanated the universe of necessity. Some ancient philosophers sort of thought in that term. So there's just some kind of impersonal uh, necessary being that just blindly, uh, you know, without purpose, emanated the contingent reality. In which case, the con and if that's right though, the universe turns out to be derivatively necessary. Um, right? It's be, why? Because it's a necessary product of a necessary being. Um, though it's not necessary intrinsically, you might say, but it's inevitable there's going to be such a thing because there, there is a thing that exists that's necessary in and of itself, and it operates necessarily in one way. It just shoots out this product. Uh, alternatively, we could suppose that the necessary being generated the universe through an internal non-deterministic mechanism. It's a chancy kind of thing. Um, having been capable of generating any of a vast array of possibilities and maybe generating more than one. So we could have a necessary being. It, it, it exists of absolute necessity, but uh, in a way that um, physicists, uh, particle physicists think might be true at, of the fundamental con uh, uh, constituents of our universe, its behavior is it, 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 there's only probabilities attaching to the operation of, of these, these fundamental mechanisms, right? There's an objective chance that it might do this, it might do that, but no guarantees, right? Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that Einstein didn't like. That's, that, that's the playing dice thing that Einstein didn't like. But unfortunately for Einstein, there's really good evidence to think that might be so. Um, as it, uh, and thirdly, so those are two possibilities. So we got a necessary being necessarily generating this contingent reality, or we got a necessary being, again impersonal uh, being, but it kind of in a chancy kind of way, or a, a non-deterministic kind of way, probabilistic way, generated this reality, and maybe some others besides. Uh, thirdly, we might say instead that the necessary being is a personal agent whose actions are guided by purposes. In short, God, right? Uh, uh, right? Some, something, now, now that, that's a possible way of thinking about necessary being, conceiving there be, to be a necessary being that has the attributes of personhood, will and intellect and so on, and ha was guided by reasons in generating the contingent reality that it did. Uh, so it, it causes the universe in accordance with some goals, a goal or set of goals. This option subdivides, though, into two possibilities. 
on the first, the totality of its goals and beliefs rendered it inevitable that it would give rise to a universe of just this sort, which perfectly reflect those goals. That's what the great 17th century Christian philosopher Leibniz thought. God of necessity would create the best of all possible worlds, right? Um, and uh, so that's what he did. And there's a sense in which it's inevitable. God would never settle for less than the best. So there's a sense in which inevitably God's going to create this. Now Leibniz himself didn't like saying that this, he tried to do fancy footwork around that word inevitable because uh, most theologians thought you shouldn't say God, you know, God's a perfectly free being. Uh, never mind what Leibniz said. Most philosophers looking at what Leibniz said said, yeah, in Leibniz's view all is necessity <laughs> despite what Leibniz himself wanted to say about that, even though he was a fantastically sharp guy, right? Um, but, you know, that's one way to go. Uh, but on the second, the, the reasons that this, this divine being, necessarily existing divine being, had for creating what he does create are resistible. It might have chosen, God might have chosen a different sort of universe, holding fixed, even given the actual goals and beliefs that God had. This, this is the more um, typical Christian theological view. God might have, perhaps even might have created nothing at all, or he might have created a different something, right? He was free in what he chose to create, right? That's different from the Leibnizian picture. All right, so, so you know, th these are different explanatory schemas that go a little bit beyond saying there was a necessary being that caused it, right? They're still, uh, so they're more informative, uh, but they're still far from full explanations. They tell us very little about the nature of the necessary being or how it acts, all right? And there are other similarly sketchy possibilities uh, uh, besides. Um, uh, again, we could try to follow Einstein and his hero Spinoza in thinking that appearances to the contrary, the universe itself is a self-contained, wholly necessary being, down to the last, most contingent seeming fact. Right? There's a little scratch on this podium. You know? Spinoza's right, it was absolutely necessary. Just like two plus two had to be four, this scratch had to be on this podium at this point in time. Absolutely necessary. Right? Right? My father had to have reached out and, and just the way that he did. Right? That, that sperm and egg cell, they had to have happened. And, and all the, the, the necessary things that had to happen for that, the, them to come into contact, all of it had to happen. All is necessity. Right? That's, that's one way you could answer the question. Really, if you think about it, it's denying the assumption of the question. You think there's contingency in, the, in reality? You're wrong. All is necessity. Um, Spinoza would say, you know, things appear contingent. You say, oh, surely the scratch didn't have to be there, and surely I could have been a roofer like my father, been miserable, no doubt, but, you know, it, it could have happened. Maybe, you know, I kind of, kind of, you know, got into some trouble, and in the end I had to end up being a roofer like my father, just like what happened to my older brother. He had, had a rough uh, teen years in his early 20s, ended up being a roofer like my father, poor guy. Um, you know, maybe that could have happened to me, but no, Spinoza would say no. Uh, the appearance that things could have gone differently is a result of our ignorance of the totality of causes, right? We don't see all the causes right down to the microphysical detail of one thing leading to another. And if you did see it, the, the, the illusion of contingency would vanish. It would look like iron necessity. Given this happened, everything would look like, you know, every, take any event. If you, if you could see all the totality of the causes, right, you would just say, well, that's got to happen. It's, you know, it's like, like a car accident, you know, if you were hovering up above in a helicopter and you saw those two cars speeding, you know, towards that, you, you know, but you had no ability to influence it, you would say it's inevitable, even though we call it an accident, right? All right, uh, so that's, that's one way of responding to the question. Or we might enrich the multiverse hypothesis with the metaphysical, not empirical thesis that the existence of the multiverse is, is itself necessary, right? You could say that. All right, though so all these hypotheses are only schematic, it is possible that we might have reason to embrace a particular one of them, even if precious few additional de uh, details are forthcoming. We would have such reason if one of them seemed to work on reflection and not to generate insoluble puzzles of its own, and two, we had weighty reasons to think that each of the alternatives we could envision either implode once we examine them and reflect on them, and that sometimes happens. Certain, sometimes philosophical ideas seem coherent, even if crazy, but when you really try to reflect on it and work it out, you say you get into contradiction. It's actually not a workable idea. The, the, 
this conceivability vanishes once you try to try to think it through. That could happen uh, for some of the possible explanations. Or there's reason to think that the alternatives we had considered are, I, I, I suppose there was reason to think we, we have an exhaustive handle on what the alternatives are. Um, uh, even if we don't have good reason to think we've considered all the possibilities, we're not in a position to see what all the possibilities are for explanatory schemas, we would have some reason to adopt the favored view, the one that looked best, although with less confidence. I mean, we do that in science, right? We, uh, it's a contingent, again, a contingent fact. What kinds of ideas have occurred to thinkers at a given point in time, right? No one's capable of contemplating all the possible theories that could explain a body of data. But still, uh, when we think, when scientists think really hard and they come up with a few possibilities and one of them looks like it best accounts for the data in the most elegant and, and uh, descriptively adequate way, we say we've got pretty good reason to think it's true, or at least you know on the right track, even though we can't be certain that there's not some totally unconceived alternative explanation um, that would would have done a better job had we only thought of it. There's no guarantee, but still, we're not skeptical. I don't, I, I, you know, the fact that we can't absolutely guarantee there's not some totally unenvisioned uh, alternative possibility doesn't mean we should have zero confidence in what looks to be the best theory. It just means we should be a little bit. Um, reserved, you know, hold out, realize that, that, that uh, we're less than certain about this. But we could still have really good reason to believe in it. Uh, so we might, and, and, you know, and, and so part of what I'm doing in, in my book, uh, this is not an advertisement for my book. I, in fact, I discourage you from trying to read the book if you haven't, don't have a bit of philosophy under your belt, because um, it's some te technical jargony aspects to it. But part of what I try to do is to systematically eliminate some of these alternatives and say theism actually um, does the it has the most, can be worked out in the most coherent way to account for contingency without collapsing all into necessity. Um, so you might think of uh, this class, this whole class of possible explanations that I've, I've gestured at this way. Explanations, especially the very general sorts of explanations that are offered in philosophy, in logic, in mathematics, and physics, very general explanations, often posit possibility containing kinds of structure of various kinds. That's sometimes what explanations do, right? That's part of what they do. For example, physics, physics posits spatiotemporal structure, right, um, of a certain sort, right, that constrains the way matter can behave. If, if space time has a shape, right, you know, since the 19th century, we've come to realize Euclid's three dimensional space is not the only possible way things might be, right? And in fact, and then Einstein comes along after this mathematical discovery and says, I, I think we have empirical reason for thinking that in fact Euclid's theory is not even true. Not only is it not the only way, but it's not actually true. We've got a slightly, ever so slightly curved kind of space time, right? So, when you, so when you're, if you're going to give a physics, you've got to say something about all this infinitely class of possible space-time structures, which one do you think is true, right? So you're, so you're positing a kind of structure. Uh, and then you gotta talk about the structure of fundamental properties uh, and relations of matter, right? Uh, and, uh, and that induces a certain kind of causal structure on the way things can go. Not just anything can happen, given that the world is, uh, involves forces of charge and mass uh, and so on, right? That's a kind of structure that's built into our universe. Uh, and, that's, and that's structure that's, uh, that's posited by theory in order to explain things that we observe. The philosopher, then, who tentatively endorses uh, one of the existing existence explaining, contingent existence explaining schemas that I mentioned, is positing an additional kind of structure to reality, an, what you might call a necessary ontic dependency of contingent physical things on a necessary being. Like pure mathematical structure and unlike spatiotemporal structure in physics, it's conceived to be structure that would, would obtain for any possible reality. Right? It's a hypothesis saying we need to add a bit more structure to our, our theoretical view of reality in order to explain the one big fact that necessarily eludes science, which is why is there anything like that after science gets done telling us what that is, what its intrinsic nature is. Okay? All right. Where am I at time-wise? I took a little bit longer doing all that than I had anticipated. Uh, whoa, we got to move along here. All right, what time do we get started? Five or ten. Okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move it along here. Um, here's a big objection that philosophers have had to this whole 
You know, it's not that they object to this or that kind of version of the necessary being kind of, kind of gambit, right, for explaining existence. They, they, they object to the whole business, and they do so this way. Um, either, if, the, if we're going to try to answer the, the ultimate, the question of existence, either we very implausibly embrace modal collapse, that is, uh, modal, modality being necessity possibility, a word philosophers use, uh, and suppose that in the final analysis nothing is contingent and all is necessity, either you do that or you're going to have to concede the existence of brute or wholly inexplicable contingency somewhere or other. And so you're going to have to give up on the, the possibility of complete or ultimate explanation. It's just there's no way to allow for some contingency in reality and still have a complete all, all loose ends tied up kind of explanation. All right? And the objectors reason, here's how they reason. They say, if there truly is a sufficient reason for every truth, a reason why it is so and not otherwise, then every truth will turn out to be a necessary truth because it's a direct consequence of the fully explicable and hence necessary activity or choice of a necessary being. If not, if there is at some point a merely contingent link, it didn't have to be that way, so if there's a merely contingent link between this necessary being that we posit and then the contingent reality that we're part of, so that this contingent world might not have existed even given the existence and nature of the necessary being, then we've after all conceded that some contingent truths are brute facts, lacking complete explanation. And if we're, if we're going to have some brute facts, why not just let the existence of what we can directly see you know, be that brute fact? Why? So no good positing, if, if, if you're positing necessary being solely to account for contingency, to explain, not want to have unexplained contingent facts, but you end up having a contingent fact about the connection between necessary being and contingent reality, well, what, what good have you done? Right? You haven't really made much progress, um, so well, just stick with what you got and just give up on seeking that explanation. This sort of objection is apt, it's appropriate, I believe, when directed at philosophers like Leibniz who maintain the so-called principle of sufficient reasons. It's construed in a strong way. However, it shares with defenders of that principle the false assumption that any complete explanation of some circumstance is necessarily and fully contrastive. So throwing a little lingo here at you in the following sense. Uh, it explains explicitly or implicitly why that state of affairs attains rather than any seemingly possible contrasting case whose occurrence is consistent with all the available mechanisms. Right? Uh, all right. So let, let me depart from the text here and just I can realize this is getting thick and heavy for some of you. Uh, so, so the idea is. Um, people say, you know, so, 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 uh, so if I ask why is there that, uh, perhaps an iPad, um, a notebooky thing there on that chair, um, and uh, maybe uh, the explanation is he put it there, okay? Um, and I say, well, why did he put it there rather than there? And suppose I can't give you an answer to that question. Oh, well, he could have done that, could have done that. He did that. That's where he put it. So I can't, no explanation why is it there rather than there, right? And then these philosophers will say, well, uh, so you haven't really explained why it's there, right? Because if you really explained why it's there, I, we'd know why it's there and not there, right? And I want to say, that's a mistake. It's a subtle mistake, right? Uh, and the mistake is thinking that to explain why something is so, you have to explain why it's so rather than being some different way that it might have been. But you can explain why it's so, even if there is no good explanation of why it's so rather than it's having been the way it is. So fundamental physics posits, at least on the normal interpretation of physics, um, of quantum mechanics, which is controversial. But all right, the standard way of thinking about it is you've got these fundamental systems that, oper that obey only probabilistic laws, not deterministic laws. And what that means is, given the total state in which they're in and, and, the, and the, the features surrounding them, uh, rather than there being just one outcome that has to come about given, given the way the, the situation is structured, there's more than one possibility. Um, you know, uh, there might be three possibilities, and they might have different 
uh, objective probabilities of, of, of occurring. But on any given occasion, any one of those three can happen. So I can tell you why, you know, if it's options A, B, and C, why A rather than D, D is ruled out by the theory, right? But I can't tell you why A rather than C. I can just, but can I tell you why A? And the answer, and the answer I want to give is sure, I can tell you why A. The, there's a mechanism in place that had the capacity to bring about A, and in fact, it did bring about A, even though it, it didn't do so inevitably. It could have brought about something else. There's still an explanation, right? You know, that's the kind, that's the way indeterministic uh, systems work, right? They bring about outcomes, even though they're capable of having brought about different outcomes from the ones that they did. But you, so you can still have an explanation of what, what uh, of the, the event that actually occurred. Similarly, Suppose we go with the necessary being interpreted as a personal transcendent cause, aka God, uh, way of thinking about um, uh, a necessary being. And we say God has reasons that are not perhaps fully transparent to us for choosing to bring about a universe like the one that we are part of. But suppose God also had some motivations for bringing about a different kind of universe that didn't involve any of us. Sorry, God's very fond of you. He loves you, right? But he's, he's not inevitably wedded to you, right? You know, he, he took seriously the possibility of never having been you, okay? There are, there are these alternatives, other good ways that the world might have been, okay? But in fact, happily for all of us, God went with option A. He opened door A. Right, when he could have opened door B or C. And you say, so why is there this, this contingent reality? Answer, uh, God, a necessarily existing reality uh, guided by certain reasons. Here we're getting schematic because I can't tell you what those reasons are, right? But by hypothesis, there, there's details here that we're missing. But, but he has reasons and he has power, the capacity to generate stuff ex nihilo, out of nothing. And that is, in fact, what he did. But then you say, could he have done something else? And, and so let's suppose the answer is yes. He could have done innumerably other sorts of things. And you say, well, why did he do this rather than any of those alternatives? Answer, there's no explanation to be had there. Now, before that starts making you nervous, it really shouldn't, right? Now, Leibniz thinks, whoa, you can't say that, right? You know, how, it, can't, it just can't be that there's no explanation of that. But that, that sounds worse than it actually is. Because what actually exists has an explanation. God brought it about. He exercised the power that he had, and it's a rational, it's a purposive kind of causality. There, there, he had a certain kind of motivation. There were certain intrinsic good-making features that he had in view in designing the universe that he did, and that's what he did. Okay? So there's an explanation for what actually came about. Now, there's this fact about what exists, that, that namely that something else could have existed, right? Um, but, it, but God didn't have decisive reasons for preferring this to that by hypothesis. I'm just entertaining that, that this way of thinking about the matter, which has been very common in the Christian tradition, that God could have uh, done a, a variety of things other than what he in fact did. And we're just, we're just supposing, for discussion's sake, that that's the right way to think about it. Then uh, there will be no explanation, right, for why this rather than those other alternatives, right? Because the only way you could give an explanation is to say that, well, inevitably, if you, give, if you knew everything about the mind of God, right, and the power of God, you could see he was going to go for this. That's what Leibniz thought, right? He would go for the best the best possible universe, so appearances to the contrary, Voltaire famously ridiculed, this is the best of all possible worlds. You know, you might think you have rough days, better days than, than some others, you know, some bad days. Leibniz says this is the best of all possible worlds. Of course, what Leibniz means by best uh, there is a, a little bit different from your way of think, probably thinking about it, but never mind that. You know, Leibniz thinks from, from God's point of view, this is the totality of creation, perhaps a big chunk of which is totally unobservable to us. The totality makes for the best of all possible worlds. But you might think there is no best of all possible worlds. That is, for any created reality, God could always make it a, a, a reality a lot like it even better by adding more stuff. You know, and uh, in order to make sure things don't get crowded, you just you know, got to expand the number of dimensions of space or something like that. It seems like there's no intrinsic upper limit 
to how good of a created reality, right? In that case, God's got to choose. He's got to make perhaps a arbitrary in the sense of a free decision, a choice among them, okay? Now, okay, so let me end on this. So, so, so then you say, well, wait a minute. So haven't you just said that there is this kind of brute fact in the end after all, you know? Yeah, you can give me an explanation why this, but I, I've got a further question. I say, yeah, but why this rather than these other possibilities that God knows about, we don't, right, uh, that, he was, that he contemplated, and you say you don't have an explanation. There's your brute fact. This, so so where, did the, where did all this get us? But notice something about this. Uh, we have an explanation for why there can be no explanation. It's not a, a really brute fact, would be a fact that just happens to be the way it is. There's no causal explanation for its being the way it is. And there's no particular reason why there's no explanation. There just isn't, right? Might have been an explanation of it, but there just isn't, period. And that's all you can say. That would be a brute, just brute, you gotta take it, fact, you know? No, no explanation. But in the case of, that we're considering, um, uh, the, the fact that we can't explain, there's no good explanation why God created this rather than these alternatives. That, that's not a brute fact, right? There's an explanation for, for, for that fact. The explanation is this. The causal source of this, right, is a being that forms choices freely, right, and has motivations that encompass a range of alternatives, just like you and I, right? On any given sunny day, you think about doing your studying and you know, like you should do and then you think about you know driving down to the beach and you know you got different motivations for doing different kinds of things and you make choices right um, and you know so if if the necessary being that's the source of all reality is like that we know why there can be no explanation why this rather than these others because the source from which the 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 this reality came is by its nature open to a range of possibilities and, so, and causal sources like that preclude deterministic explanations that you know, say, why this rather than any other possibility? It's just like that in fundamental physics, right? You know, go back, you've got, if you've got these st statistically uh, governed systems that say you can have option A, you can have option B, you can have option C, they're all possibilities, right? Um, but on any given occasion, it's not like things just pop into reality without causes. No, there, there are causes at work. Uh, but then you say, yeah, why, why this outcome rather than that? And you say, but here's the nature of the system that produced this, what actually occurred. Its nature is such, right, that it's capable of producing any of the range of them, right? It's a, it's a non-deterministic kind of causality. And that precludes then this kind of contrastive explanation, right? So we know why. So, 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 so yeah, I can't tell you why this rather than that, but I know why you can't tell this rather than that. So it's not really a brute explanation. Okay, you've been very patient, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I've skipped many pages. You saw that, right? Um, I just want one final page, and it's double-spaced. Okay, so, so. Uh, finally, which existence question? Um, we are now finally in a position to see that certain ways of formulating the question regarding contingent existence that is to be answered make questionable assumptions about the form an explanation schema for existence must take. You might think it's kind of perverse that I end the talk by saying what question should we be asking, right? But I think everything I set up to now helps us to better see how we should formulate the question in a way that doesn't beg questions about the possible um, alternatives that an explanation could take. It is commonly put this way. People often put the question of existence this way. Why is there anything at all? But this very pres that very general formulation admits importantly distinct ways of making it more precise. You could ask, so, so here are some more precise ways of asking this question. Why are there contingent things, things that might not have been? Why are there contingent things? Not why are there these things, but just why are there contingent things in general? That's a question, but it's a different question from this question. Why are there contingent things rather than there being nothing contingent at all? Here's a third question. Again, it's a distinct question. Why do these contingent things exist? And then finally, a fourth question. 
Why do these contingent things exist rather than those apparently possible other things? I suggest, then, that the best formulation of the question is the one given at the bottom of your handout, what I've called the basic question of contingent existence. Are there contingently existing things? We don't want to just beg the question against Spinoza, who denies that there is, right? So we say, are there contingently existing objects? And if there are, why do those particular contingent objects there are exist and undergo the events that they do? Why do they exist and operate the way that they do? The reason I say that we should prefer this formulation is that it presumes the least about what is there to be explained and what form a true explanation may turn out to have. Spinoza and perhaps Einstein want to question the very common assumption that there are any contingent truths at all. The second half, so that's why the first clause, the second half of the basic question sets a minimum bar for precluding brutally or wholly inexplicable contingent existences or occurrences in reality. Some explanations uh, that uh, are consistent with uh, what, what I called on the handout, and I didn't talk about principle of contingent explanation one and principle of contingent explanation two, uh, are not consistent with the principle, so-called principle of sufficient re uh, reason that Leibniz famously enunciated, but they're no worse than that. They're no worse for that. Contingency rooted in indeterministic causes need not be brute.